I'd like to make this as informal as possible. Um, a note, the event last night at Pritzker has me uh, paired with um, Carolyn Janey, who runs the Civil War Institute at the University of West Virginia. I think it's going to be telecast. They told us maybe next week. Uh, give it a watch. It's very instructive in a lot of ways, and also the differences between academic historians and those who are trained in other disciplines. I will leave it at that. Uh, it's interesting, I mean, she's obviously very knowledgeable, but the perspectives are different and the material is different. The talk I was asked to give today has become very quickly one of my most popular talks. And it's about an entity that I find fascinating and is a major part of the book, in particular in the beginning. And that's the Veteran Reserve Corps. Show of hands, who's here has ever heard of the Veteran Reserve Corps? Well, of course, the Civil War group, but I'm impressed. What was the original name of the Veteran Reserve Corps? Invalid. The Invalid Corps. And we're going to talk about one of the worst names ever given to anything. Um, I do, this is, this is kind of interesting. I joined the faculty at Shepherd about a year ago. And after having spent my entire career teaching medical students, residents, other physicians, and um, medical professionals, and this is my first time teaching undergraduates since the 70s. And let me say first, my, my students are terrific. And I specifically wanted to teach at a state university because I am a product of the New York City public school system. And I'm also a product of a state university, which didn't happen to be my state university. I graduated from the Honest Tutorial College at Ohio University. The only private u university I ever attended was medical school when I went to NYU. And I'm a great believer in state universities. So when I signed on at Shepherd, they wanted adjunct faculty, which means we get paid poorly <laughs> and we do it for love. Um, but it also meant that they wanted people with interdisciplinary viewpoints. And the two things, many things I asked them, but one of, one of the things I asked them in particular was, how much do I tell the students about myself? Now, as a psychiatrist, when you treat patients, you never talk about yourself because the focus is on the patients. They were absolutely fascinated with what my background was. And bear in mind that my students weren't even alive when 9-11 occurred. And I'm talking about the Civil War, World War I, uh, World War II, Nam, Iraq and Afghanistan. And they were fascinated to hear about events that occurred, such as when it was Dr. King's birthday. And I was able to tell them what it was like when we heard the news. And I told them it was one of the worst days of my life was when Dr. King was assassinated. And they asked about the Kennedy assassination and other things. And the other thing was, my wife actually uh, brought this up. She says, are you asking my husband to join the faculty because he's still able to chew his food and to talk about these events? <laughs> and they essentially said yes. So take it for what you will. The other aspect I think is very important and it's in the acknowledgement that I wrote for my first book. I'm a product of the Vietnam era. I did not serve in Nam. I was not a member of the military. I did miss the lottery by a year. My brother was in the last lottery. Any of us who lived through that era knows it was a shaping event in American history and certainly a shaping event in those of us who lived through it. And I frankly did not realize until actually the last few years. I, I kind of had an inkling, but it's become blatantly obvious to me that one of the reasons I became a psychiatrist was Nam. I was always interested in, in why people went to war. I was always fascinated by the Civil War. And then I'm living through the Vietnam era and protesting the war, as my family did. And I come from a family of veterans. My grandfather served in World War I, stateside. My father served 
as a physician throughout the entire Korean War. And my brother spent 20 years in the Air Force, uh, retiring as a lieutenant colonel, also a physician. I've served in federal service, but not military service. I was a VA doc, of which I'm extremely proud. And I, my second time in public service was when I joined the Food and Drug Administration. So I've been a public physician for many years. I worked for the state of Indiana. I spent most of my life in public service. And those of us who are in public service, federal service, take the same oath with the exception of mentioning of military orders as the military text. And about two months ago, I heard what I think was one of the finest speeches ever given about what it means to serve by retiring command, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley. Did people watch his retirement speech? I could not recommend it to you any more highly. He talked about one thing, and that's the oath that they take to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's what he talked about. And the context of that, and certainly the context we have right now about that. And he made the point that of all the militaries in the world, including the Israelis, the Israelis do not take an oath to a constitution because the Israelis do not have a constitution. But as you know, they take an oath when they go to Masada. The American military does not take an oath to a president, a monarch, a ruler. They take an oath to protect and defend the constitution of the United States. I took the same oath. And once you've taken, and there are other people in the room who have taken that oath. Once you take that oath, you become part of something much greater than yourself. And what I write about in One More Water Fight and my work that I do on veterans is, is caught up in why people have gone to war, but just as importantly, if not more important, what happens when they return? And what do they do with the reasons why they fought? People talk about Greenwich Generation, which was coined about the World War II veterans. Of course, were magnificent, including my father-in-law, who landed at Utah Beach, fought in the Battle of Bulge, and as a first-generation American Jew, was a concentration camp liberator. Rarely talked about it until I married into the family. And he started talking about it with me, although, there, believe me, there were questions I wish I had asked him. But he was a great source of validation for the work I was doing here. He loved the stuff I had in the Civil War veterans I'll be describing because they so resonated with what he'd experienced. That line for the men who served in the Civil War, white and black, all the way through to our current military is there. And those of you who serve in the military know how important tradition is and traditions that have tremendous validity honor, service, knowing that the person next to you is literally a brother and will defend that way, brother and sister now. And these are elements that in some ways have been lost because the universal experience of military service and national service is gone because there is no draft, thankfully. There's no mandate. We're one of the few republics that do not have mandatory national service. And in my state, the state of Maryland, our new governor, who was a decorated combat veteran, Wes Moore, is trying to have it mandated that in schools that there be mandatory public service. So I cannot advocate for this enough. Again, the, the idea of being part of something larger than yourself. I say this as a preamble to what I'll be talking about today and also what I describe in the first of my books. And several of you have asked me to say a few words about the left arm corps, which um, will lead into what I'm talking about with the Veteran Reserve Corps. My experience with the left arm corps started with my dear friend, Dr. John Sellers, who at the time was the historical specialist 
for the Civil War and Reconstruction at the Library of Congress. And I'd gotten to know John, again, dear friend, he's greatly missed by me and Kit. And John never lost the thrill of the documents that he was a caretaker of. He handed me, the first time I visited, he handed me George Washington's surveying book. And my hands went trembling. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, he just handed it to me. And he, at one point he apologized to me because he couldn't show me one of the copies of the Gettysburg Address because it would take an act of Congress to get me in. I, I slid him on that one. <laughs> and he gave me a folio version. John never lost that thrill. And by the way, he showed me the lost order, Order 191, which was found before the Battle of Antietam. I've never lost that either. When you go into the National Archives, when you go into the Library of Congress, and you have these documents in your hands, you're part of history. And we own those documents. They're owned by the American people. We all have the rights to view them and to see them and to utilize them. So what happened was, having gotten very close with John, we had left um, the Maryland, D.C. area to go to New Jersey to take new jobs. But John asked me, he says, look, there's a collection that we've got at the library called the William Olin Bourne Papers. And we're really thinking of retiring the collection, making it not available to researchers for lack of interest. He says, I'd like you to take a look at it. And he picked me in particular as a physician and a psychiatrist. I took a look at the collection for 10 minutes, went to John's office across the way from the reading room, and I said, you cannot retire this collection. And his, his face lit up. It was a setup, of course. I knew that John wanted, I knew that John, he knew what I was gonna say. But he was absolutely right. I said, John, you can't retire this collection. This is absolute gold. I'll curate it for you, but I gotta do it from New Jersey. And it took me years. What was the collection? William Olin Bourne was a reformer, teacher, clergyman, who became the unofficial chaplain at Central Park Hospital, a tertiary care hospital that lasted three years, and literally in Central Park in New York. There are no records from Central Park Hospital. I don't know where they went. They just don't exist. Other than what's in the marvelous uh, medical records, the medical and surgical registers, which, by the way, are amazing if you haven't read through them. And the operational records are in there but they haven't got separate records from Central Park Hospital. But William Olin Bourne became an unofficial chaplain. He worked at the hospital for the three years that existed. He became so close to the men to whom he ministered that when the war was ending, he had founded a, a periodical called The Soldier's Friend, which lasted about four years. He put together a contest, national contest, with prize money to encourage men who had lost the use of their right arms, hands or arms in combat to start writing with their left hand. That's, what it, that's all it was. Classic occupational therapy, by the way. And they ended up with 260, 270 submissions. They were asked for a handwriting sample and they could mention some patriotic themes. What these men wrote are the damnedest things you've ever read in your life. These were men writing about everything they had experienced right as the war was ending. Many of them, by the way, still in the service. So this was 1865 to 1866. You can't beat this. The first thing I published was an article in North and South which actually got a fair amount of notoriety, including Dwight McKaithley when he was the chief historian of the Park Service, which no one had looked at. He had kept three autograph books that men had written inscriptions into. There was like 500 inscriptions. So I published that as a cross-sectional study. Never meant to be published, by the way. And it's a great um, study of morale of men during the war itself because the autograph books covered the three years he was there. I published that. 
Then John said, what are you going to do next? And I said, I'm going to track down all 270 of these men. And he said, no one's ever done that. There's probably a good reason why no one's done this. <laughs> Little did I know that there were many good reasons why no one had done that. But then he sends me over to the National Archives to Mike Music, the Civil War specialist at the National Archives, who taught me how to use the microfiche and the hand cranks. And if you've done this research, you know what it's like. And I tracked down actually 268. Two of them turned out to be imposters, if you can believe this. One imposter and one man who actually did not use the, uh, did not lose his right arm function, he lost left arm function. But one man was an absolute imposter. So it's 268. Once I got that information, and as Dr. Kane and I were talking about, one of the great advantages when you do research at the National Archives records, as a physician, is also medical records, pure and simple. And the first time I looked at one of the files, I called my brother, again, is a physician himself, and an Air Force physician at the time, and I said, you're not going to believe this. I really think someone bought hundreds of thousands of forms in the 1860s, because those are the forms I used for my VA intake. <laughs> In the 70s and 80s, they were exact same forms with the dermatomes, remember those? And he couldn't stop laughing. And he said, you're probably right. So I did that. I then used that information to track down every other bit of information I could find on these 268 men. Then the epidemiologist in me took over because I wanted to know if these men were representative of all Union white Northern soldiers. I didn't know that going in. I had a feeling they were. Now, why does that matter? This was a national sample, which almost does not exist in any other data set. Usually they're regimental. 98% of them were enlisted men. That's unheard of in any sample. 15% of them did become officers, but they came, became officers predominantly from the enlisted ranks. There are two free men of color in the, in the um, left arm corps, uh, Robert Pinn and William Hamill Thomas. Both of them actually became quite famous. One became famous, one became notorious. And there were two formerly enslaved men from Maryland who were in the autograph books. So obviously they're not representative in terms of volume of African American soldiers. What I then did was I went to an absolute resource, which was Gould's 1868 book on one million Union soldiers, the demographics. Magnificent book published through the uh, Sanitary Commission. And what, with all that information I had, those men were as representative a sample of the white early volunteer soldier that exists anywhere. They were indistinguishable from the other two and a half million white soldiers who volunteered. I have followed them throughout their entire lives. The first man was born in 1812. The last one died in 1937. And by the way, I could not get all the files because what happened in 1930? The VA came in. Those files are not at the National Archives. Those are in the VA files. They're not available. Because the Pension Bureau and the National Home for Disabled Soldiers became the VA. I couldn't get those. I was able to get, the, I was able to get other records. I have the autopsy findings and others are about two-thirds of them. And again, I'm a trained physician. And as a psychiatrist, my entire career has spanned the classification and inclusion of post-traumatic stress disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders, the DSM. Having said that, I have treated and diagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder. However, I continue to reiterate in every talk I give that the vast majority of those who go to war do not manifest post-traumatic stress disorder during their lifetimes. This has been shown consistently from war to war. 
including data from the IDF. I will repeat this. The vast majority of those who go to war do not manifest PTSD. Those who do manifest PTSD is between 14 and 17 percent lifetime. It's lower in the, in the IDF, by the way. What we have discovered in the past several years now with women serving in combat and with the change to the volunteer army, the actual incidence and prevalence in women is much higher than in men, which obviously is of concern. So these are all issues. Now, how does this inform my work? I'm not a trained historian, but I'm a trained shrink, physician, epidemiologist, and clinical pharmacologist. So I figured those are fair disciplines to use. That doesn't mean my scholarship is any different than historians. I look at the same material. I have the same um, use of data. But I also use some information they don't use. This book, and there will be others, One More War to Fight is 86% primary material. I do not rely heavily on other historians' work, nor do I rely heavily on their interpretation of information unless one called for, like Eric Foner and others. A great majority of the primary material I use in One More War to Fight are the newspapers of the time, which are absolutely phenomenal. Has anyone used in your research the newspapers from the 19th? They're, incredi they're incredible, aren't they? And now, of course, you've got two great databases. You've got the ever-growing Chronicling America, which is the Library of Congress. There are up to 22 million articles. Then there's a person I've never met in upstate New York who does the old Fulton postcards. I think he's up to 50, 55 million. He does this for, for fun. Thankfully, he does this. So you don't have to go into state archives anymore and flip the pages because it's all digitalized. And these, these newspapers are a gold mine, and they're constantly being added to. The one state that's missing up until recently from the Library of Congress database is Massachusetts. It's the last one they added. They've had you know, Hawaii, uh, other places. They didn't have Massachusetts. They're finally adding Massachusetts. So there are things that we'll now be able to get through that, probably through the, you know, the Boston Library. All of this is in service of explaining what information I use. I use the left arm core as a representative sample, but let me be clear, they are not the focus of one more water fight. They're an aspect of that, because my focus is Union soldiers and sailors in toto, which is why I use the Grand Army of the Republic to a large extent in one more water fight, because Unlike the Left Arm Corps, highly representative, but there's only 268 of them. The Grand Army of the Republic, it's estimated that 50% of all Union veterans, black and white, were members of the Grand Army of the Republic at some point in their lives. That's more than a million men. That's a large sample to be able to draw conclusions on that. Any questions on this so far? I haven't lost you yet, have I? Okay. The Civil War ends. There's some things that need to be emphasized. This dwarfed not only the number of men who had served in the war, but the number of returning veterans of any war, including, by the way, wars after this. If the, if the same percentage of the population in 2023 died as died during the Civil War, six million men would be dead now. That's how many people served in the Confederacy and in the Union. Union soldiers themselves, 360,000 dead, over, over 250,000 wounded. The numbers between white soldiers and black soldiers, approximately 180,000 men of color served. One third were free men of color. Two thirds were formerly enslaved. Plus there were African Americans who served in the navies of the Union under a quota system. It is a stat that I'm really promoting these days, living in Maryland and now doing a lot of Maryland research. What percentage have people generally been told of white soldiers in Maryland who served in the Confederacy versus the Union? What percentage has generally have been cited previously? Were they equal, about 
Union versus Confederate? Anybody? I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. <laughs> yeah. Um, completely wrong. Anywhere between five to ten to one, white men of Maryland served in Union armies. It's a remarkable statistic. There were 9,000 men of color from Maryland who served. And let me point this out about Maryland, a border slave state that remained loyal to the Union. <coughs> there were more free African Americans in the state of Maryland in 1860 than any other border state or any state that did not have slavery. 89,000. 49% of African Americans in 1860 in Maryland were free people of color. That's a, that's a statistic a lot of people don't know. Yeah? Why? Why? What were they doing? They're the agricultural. What attracted us to Maryland? Have you ever been to Maryland? It's one of the most beautiful states in the Union. Uh, it's got a great climate. Um, there were people who either bought themselves free or were manumitted, as you know. Plus, there have been African Americans in Maryland from the beginning in terms of that. Plus, it's right, it's below the Mason-Dixon line, but what's right above the Mason-Dixon line? Freedom. And there's a great um, site in Cumberland, Maryland, which is four miles from the Pennsylvania border in one of the churches that Kit and I visited recently. It was fascinating where people were kept there until midnight when they could make their way into Pennsylvania. And when you were in Pennsylvania, you were in free territory. Something else about the state of Maryland. What happened in 1864 in November? What did the state of Maryland do? The only border state to do it. They abolished slavery. A lot of people don't know that. That's a year before the 13th Amendment was ratified. A year before. A lot of people don't realize that. So that now there's a whole new teaching about the state of Maryland. And there's a whole, I mean, at Monocacy, where I do a lot of work with the, with the National Park Service there, the information that's being turned up, including, by the way, on the site of the battlefield, Monocacy Junction was one of the recruiting centers for the United States Colored Troops, the USCT. And the more we learn, the more we get these amazing stories. And again, two of the men in the autograph books were both men who had been enslaved in Maryland. I tracked them down also. They were both illiterate at the time. Both of their inscriptions were written by a white soldier who had fought at Fort Wagner and in the Battle of the Crater. What do those two battles have in common? They involved African-American soldiers. And this white soldier wrote their inscriptions for them, I believe, in tribute to what he had seen of black soldiers. And as you know, one of the most radical, radicalized things that occurred to white Northern soldiers during the war was their opinion as African-Americans. Most white soldiers were against African Americans serving as soldiers. By 1865, the majority, and there's good evidence for that, of white Northern soldiers had tremendous respect for black soldiers because they'd fought alongside them. They'd seen the kind of men they were. They recognized their intelligence. They resented the fact that their black comrades could not become officers. And I have writings on that. 100, 100 black men did become officers. They did get the commissions through the end of the war. So Massachusetts 54th and 55th, generally chaplains, physicians, and others. Some did get commissions that way. So all these things happened. Now, the thing I was asked to talk about today, in, in addition, was the Veteran Reserve Corps. And one of the things I do want to point out, what did people feel about those who were disabled in the 1860s in the United States. How were they treated? Horribly, terribly. <laughs> they, people viewed disability as some moral transgression. No exaggeration. And if you helped someone who was disabled, you would be enabling them. 
You would take away their dignity. You would take away their initiative. This was, this was the attitude. This is in the midst of a war in which tens of thousands of men lost arms and legs, actually close to 100, lost arms and legs on both sides. So that was one aspect. No VA. The VA started in 1930. Think about no VA. The only system of health care was the Pension Bureau, and that was only for those men who were disabled. And by the way, disability initially was only determined as being unable to perform manual labor. That was it. A lot of advances came out of the Civil War. Transfusions, by the way, came out of the Civil War and others. But the definition of disability changed over time because of the Pension Bureau for Union Soldiers. And I used to do disability determinations for the VA, psychiatric determinations. So I felt very much a part of that when I saw that. Thirdly, you had no health care system per se other than the Union hospitals, all of which closed when the war ended, including you know, those fabulous hospitals in Philadelphia where American neurology was, was born, Jacob DaCosta did his work on soldier's heart, which by the way was not PTSD, it was what is now be, would be considered panic disorder. DaCosta's work was, was um, life-changing when it came to American psychiatry as functional disorders. A lot of advances came out of this. So what happened? Something changed in 1863 when the Union realized, actually 1862 is when it started, there was a manpower shortage. Don't forget, all volunteers in 61, 62. The draft, as you know, proved to be disastrous in many ways. The first thing it did was it caused the worst race riot that remains in American history, the New York City draft riots, where they, where they literally trained soldiers in from Gettysburg to put down the riots. And by the way, the Gangs of New York is not the thing to watch to find out about the draft riots. <laughs> he had a great opportunity, and I love Marty Scorsese, he had a great opportunity to really show the story. Watch some of the documentaries about the draft riots in terms of that. But they had, there was a problem. You had men going into hospitals and never leaving hospitals. The convalescents. They didn't know what to do with them. But there was something else, something called soldier's pride, the warrior identity, which has not been talked about much in relation to the Veteran Reserve Corps. When men and now women go to war, they develop something called the warrior identity, powerful during war, even more powerful during peace, which again is what, was what General Milley talked about. And again, my father-in-law is a manifestation of that. One of the most gentle men you've ever known, but he had survived combat. In my work with veterans, I'm often asked this question. Is it war that people find difficult? I say it's the absence of war that many find more difficult. Because when you return from, if you've survived combat, how do you replicate those feelings in civilian life? They don't exist. I mean, um, some of the great soldier writers, Rufus Dawes, arguably the greatest soldier writer from the Civil War. Eugene Sledge. If you haven't read Eugene's, your fellow Marine, I'm sure you've read them, wrote two magnificent books um, uh, with the old guard of Peleliu, and I believe his second book, China Marines, even better, because that describes what happens when he came home. By the way, if you've seen the magnificent miniseries, The Pacific, Eugene Sledge is one of the three main characters that they, and Bob Leck is marvelous book. You know, um, I'm a helmet, helmet, a pillow, I'm, I'm helmet for my pillow, another Marine, and of course, John Bazalone, who died after receiving the Medal of Honor. Then you've got the great Vietnam writers, Carl Melantes, uh, Tim O'Brien, Philip Caputo. These are great writers, and these are men who have been in combat and have been, been forever altered by it. But then you got someone like William Broyles Jr., another Vietnam veteran, the officer, the screenwriter. He wrote Castaway and others. 
He wrote one of the finest articles I've ever read, which is online. He wrote it for Esquire called The Love of War. He wrote it in, 18, in 1984. And he talked about the difficulty of transition to civilian life when you've been in combat. And then, of course, you've got Dispatches, Michael Herr's book, which I believe rivals the Iliad as, as the greatest book ever written about men at war. In my work with veterans, which has been so rewarding, it's that transition of not being part of something like that. It's not knowing who to trust. It's trying to translate a relationship that's so primal that you can't find in civilian life. That's where a lot of the difficulty comes. That's why the VA is so important. That's why veterans groups are so important. That's why the Grand Army was so important as a therapeutic tool. So these are the kinds of things we're talking about. Now, the soldier's pride, the warrior identity, was an aspect of why the Invalid Corps, later the Veterans Reserve Corps, came into existence. Because there were men who were severely wounded or severely ill who did not want to leave the Union service. And this was recognized. So to its credit, the Department of War decided to institute the Invalid Corps in April of 1863. And again, enlightened, this was enlightened self-interest. They wanted to keep them in because if you could have the man positions that would not take men off the line, such as garrison duty, hospital duty, light combat duty, it would enable others to take their place. That was, that was one of the main thrusts. You had to be deserving and meritorious. You had to be inspected by a physician, obviously, to make sure you were eligible. And it would enable them to continue in service, which they did recognize. Now, it was different for enlisted men and officers. They were under different enlistments, and they were in different qualifications. This is interesting. They had something very much in common with the Invalid Corps, as did the United States Colored Troops. Did white regiments have officers that had to pass an examination? Depends on. But was there an established, was there an established mechanism in white regiments about passing exams that was standardized? The answer is no. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, for example, did institute training. You're absolutely right. That was different with the Invalid Corps. They had to go through a board to be considered eligible to be officers in the Veteran Reserve Corps. The same thing happened with the USCT. One of the reasons why the USCT's concept, based on racism, that blacks could not be officers themselves, had one positive aspect. They ended up with, in some ways, better officers than many white regiments because they only took experienced non-commissioned officers and gave them commissions in the USCT after being examined and trained. And the black troops themselves always talked about what great line officers they had. Uh, that's Joseph Flatow's book, Forged in Battle. That was, those were the only two cases they had that. Now, the, for enlisted men, the vast majority were transfers from field units, so they weren't lost to the hospitals. And originally, there were going to be three battalions. One, you could carry a musket, which I think is a very important, <laughs> it's a very important characteristic. What did the muskets weigh, by the way, the stand in Springfield? Yeah, nine pounds. I mean, these were not small, in, small in, these were not Uzis. I mean, these were huge muskets. They had to be able, that would be the first, that would be the first battalion. Second battalion were men who had lost an extremity, like the, the um, left arm corps. Then there was going to be, believe it or not, a third battalion of the men most severely disabled. I'm sure this will not shock you. The third battalion never existed, because I don't know who could possibly have served, possibly have served these. You had people who could carry a musket but couldn't march. You had people who lost a limb. I have no idea who they thought would populate the third battalion, but there never was a third battalion, so there you go. <laughs> 18,000 officers and men were in the Corps by the end of six months. So this worked. Now, this is interesting. Those who actually shouldered rifles 
was double those who did hospital and clerical work. And eventually, it was three to one. I find that very interesting, because it's not the way it was originally intended. So these were men who could still perform combat duty, and I'm going to give you a great example of one in particular. Uh, many of these men were medically ill. In many cases, chronic diarrhea, as you know, which was endemic in terms of that. And I'm sure some of them had venereal disease, which led to what I still think is the greatest single line about medical care during the Civil War, a night with Venus, a lifetime with Mercury. <laughs> Mercury, of course, did not work, but I, I, I can't resist quoting that line. And then there's also the greatest one-line attribution of cause and effect that exists in the Civil War when George Pickett was asked why the Union Army was victorious at Gettysburg. His one comment was, I think the Union Army had something to do with it. <laughs> which has been ignored by historians ever since for all the reasons why Lee lost. I thought Pickett gave a great reason, because they were defeated by the Union Army. All right. Two terrible decisions were made initially. They call them an invalid corps. How would you like to serve in an invalid corps? I mean, horrible name. That subject men who were, again, disabled in combat was subject to ridicule by their able-bodied comrades. And this is from E.D. Townsend, who wrote a marvelous report. He was the adjutant general. And Townsend's report is, is marvelous. This is going to be in my book to come out next. I have a whole chapter on the Veteran Reserve Corps. And there's another problem. Fred Pelker, in his book, because by the way, only a couple of other scientists have actually written about this. Fred Pelker pointed out, Invalid Corps, I see. Anyone know what the acronym IC meant during the Civil War? Boy, you're great. <laughs> Who, this guy's a ringer. Who put him in here? No, that's great. Can you, you explain to the audience what IC was? What it, expect the condemned meant? Yeah, rotten meat. Right. This is what they come up with as an acronym. Probably unknowingly in that sense. This didn't work. But to its credit, the War Department recognized its blunder a year later it changed the name to the Veteran Reserve Corps in immediate benefit, immediate to that, big change. It also enlarged the recruitment, because don't forget, you had to agree to go into the Veteran Reserve Corps, as some did. And it also, they had also done something else. Have you ever seen the uniforms they initially had them wear? Do you know about the uniforms? Boy, who is this guy? <laughs> You're terrific. Yeah. But they were beautiful uniforms, am I right? But they looked nothing like the Union uniforms. As they were described, they were dashing and becoming. I'll give you the description. A dark blue forage cap, sky blue trousers, a sky blue kersey jacket trimmed with dark blue and cut long in the waist. That's absolutely beautiful. It looked nothing like what Union soldiers were wearing. Even the Zawabs didn't look like this. Uh, in terms of that. And the officers were even worse because they had collars, cuffs, and shoulder straps of dark blue velvet. This is what I wore in the mid-70s. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Remember these? And this is what leisure suits look like. <laughs> yes, I own the leisure suit. What can I tell you? With Kiana shirts. I, I mean, hat. we all live through this era. Yes. <laughs> so what was the reaction? The reaction was disastrous. The men bitterly resented. Matter of fact, they refused to wear these uniforms. And my friend Steve Fan, who used to be the park ranger at Fort Stevens, now is at a marvelous new site in Kentucky. Steve had someone actually craft one of these uniforms. And we did a talk in, in Washington. And, and by the way, they're absolutely beautiful, but you can't believe what they look like. So the, the War Department relented and allowed the men to wear what they had formerly worn. I, this is not a trivial thing. This meant a lot to them because their, identi their identities were as soldiers. And by the way, these were only members of the Army. This was not eligibility for sailors. These were, these were soldiers, you know, branches of the Army service, not sailors. Now, 60, more than 60,000 men joined the Veteran Reserve Corps. That's a lot. Now, again, over, you know, close to 3 million served, but that's a lot of manpower to have available to you. And what's really fascinating about it is 
how many men joined up. And by the way, the left arm corps is a great example of that. 18 of them joined the VRC. Again, not a surprise. These were men who had lost use of their, of their arms. But what's interesting, of the left arm corps, 34 of them remained in military service despite losing the use of their right arms. 16 went back to their regiments or another field regiment. The other 18 went to the VRC. Now, this is what Bruce Catton, the great Bruce Catton, who I think we all grew up on in terms of Civil War. Don't we all start with Catton? He described a VRC regiment as hopelessly crippled men who did not seem to think that mere physical disability need keep a man out of the army. This does not strike me as positive. <laughs> uh, this is not a positive representation. By the way, that was the first time I'd ever heard of it was in Catton, you know, the first time. Well, he started finally to write more positively about them later on, but not the way they've been written about now by Paul Sambala, Fred Pelker, and myself. Now, the VRC has two very important things I'm going to mention as we go along. One of them is a battle that's become more written about, more understood, and re realize its importance, its great importance, was the Battle of Monocacy. Who here has been to Monocacy? If you ever have a chance, it's one of the great Park Service sites. It's got a five-stop tour. It's got a great museum. The park ranges are terrific. We discuss a lot of things that people never used to talk about on Park Service sites, like Reconstruction, Juneteenth. I gave this talk initially at Monocacy. I actually did it twice um, as part of the commemoration, and it's, it's hysterical. I gave the same talk on both days. It was like different talks, because the questions were all different. What happened in Monocacy was Lou Wallace, who was in disgrace. He essentially had been cashiered because Grant perceived that he had gone the wrong way at Shiloh. And there's doubt that Lou Wallace had gone the, long way, the wrong way at Shiloh. There's no doubt he completely redeemed himself on the second day of Shiloh. And Lou Wallace, oh, not, a, not a trained soldier, was a terrific soldier, as you know, and became a fine general. But he'd been, he'd, been, he'd been cast aside. They give him the middle department. The middle department was Delaware and Maryland to west of the boundaries of the Monocacy River and Baltimore, with all of 2,300 men, the Eighth Corps, in an area of the Civil War that was not very active at the time. Lou Wallace gets there in March, and in July fights one of the most important battles of the Civil War, the Battle of Monocacy. Why is it so important? Because Lou Wallace, outnumbered five to one, somehow holds off Jubal Early for 36 hours. With many of his men in combat for the first time, holding off Jubal Early's corps, you know, some of the finest soldiers in the Army of Northern, Northern, Northern Virginia. He holds them off for 36 hours. What does those 36 hours enable them to do in a, the next day? save the nation's capital. If he does not hold off Early, Early does take, Early couldn't have stayed in the capital, but he would have taken over the capital, and might have cost Lee, uh, Abraham Lincoln the election, because the government would have had to flee. And it's, it's an incredible story in terms of that. But there's a VRC component to the Battle of Monocacy, because the Veteran Reserve Corps served in the Battle of Fort Stevens, in the battle to save Washington. Yet their contribution is almost never acknowledged. It's completely overlooked. And I've got three articles from the National Tribune over two decades of outraged veterans of the VRC demanding to know why they're completely overlooked when they talk about the Battle of Fort Stevens because the VRC fought in the Battle of Fort Stevens. Not only that, there was a Medal of Honor awardee in one of the regiments who fought there. And the commander of the garrisons in Washington specifically talked about the tremendous contributions of the VRC. 
But yet, in the history of this, until we've unearthed some of this, as I did recently, they weren't even talked about. And they resented this because they were members of the army and they fought. And they felt they were being completely overlooked. Now, why the attitudes about the VRC? Well, there was a minority gold bricking aspect to the VRC. I mean, there's no denying that, but it was a minority. But that does not dis really explain why able-bodied men would be so disdainful of comrades who had been disabled in combat. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. You certainly don't see that now. Now, why would that be? The attitudes towards disability is certainly an aspect of that. Both our armies and society reflect each other, positive and negative. So as citizens, they would have the same attitudes as their fellows. Although you would have thought after being through war, they wouldn't when it came to someone who had been disabled. What has not been written about, which I am writing about, is I think something even more basic, fear. Because if you're seeing the living manifestation of what can happen to you in combat, that's the last thing you want to see. Because these were men missing arms and legs. Every soldier knows the same thing can happen to them in any combat situation. And these men were right there. They couldn't ignore this. And they couldn't ignore the fact that it could happen to them. And I think there's an aspect of that. So instead of identifying with the members of the VRC, they shun them out of their own fear. I'm not saying this in any way to be hurtful about the able-bodied men, but they're human beings and this fear. And again, someone who's worked with those who've been in combat and have had the privilege of sharing this, of what it means to be in combat. When you've been in combat, you have nothing to prove to anybody else. And the greatest of soldiers will tell you that courage is not inexhaustible. There's a reason why there's a word missing from that book and will be missing from my next books, unless it's in exact quotes. Anyone want to guess what that word that's missing, that's overused? The word hero does not appear in my book unless it's in exact quotes. And I'll tell you why it doesn't appear unless it's in exact quotes. I have never known a man or woman who's been to war who's ever used the word hero about his or herself, ever. As a matter of fact, if they use it, I'm convinced they've never been in combat or even served in the military. If they use the term hero, they talk about other people, but not themselves. And one of the great examples of that is Dick Winters. If you saw the Band of Brothers, Dick Winters rose to the rank of major. And in the last episode of the Band of Brothers, there's a great, matter of fact, he breaks down as he says it. I'll try not to. His grandson asked him if he was a hero. And Dick Winters says, no, but I served in a company of heroes. That's what the warrior identity is. And in this case, they were able to stay in the service because of some forward thinking in the War Department. Again, initially enlightened self-interest, but they had an inkling that there were men who wanted to stay in the service. What they had no idea would happen is what would happen during Reconstruction because that was not planned. What happened was there was a Freedmen's Bureau, a remarkable organization. And let's do, make two things clear about the Freedmen's Bureau. It was underfunded. It barely existed, because Andrew Johnson did not want a Freedmen's Bureau. He vetoed the Freedmen's Bureau bill, and then when the 1866 midterm elections came solidly for the progressive Republicans, they overrode his veto. The second aspect was who sent the most personnel to man the Freedmen's Bureau? Because don't forget, the Freedmen's Bureau was a military operation. People don't realize that. It was under the War Department. It was part of the Army. 
who supplied so many of their officers? The Veteran Reserve Corps. Nobody had planned this, but it is abundantly clear that if the Freedmen's Bureau did not have the availability of members of the Veteran Reserve Corps, it would not be as nearly as effective. Why do I say that? They chose to stay in service. And as I write about in One More War to Fight, they chose to stay in the service because the work had to continue. When Lincoln talked about the unfinished work at Gettysburg, what was he talking about? He was talking about freedom, the, the abolition of slavery. He was not talking about equality for African Americans. That was the unfinished work of Reconstruction and what happened after Reconstruction, and which, still on, which is actually still ongoing, as we know. The Union soldiers knew that, white and black. They knew there was another war to fight. That's why I call it a war, a war without bullets. But a war is dangerous in many ways as the war itself. So that those who chose to remain in the Veteran Reserve Corps, and by the way, in four U.S. Army units composed of amputees. There were four, yeah, I know, it's amazing. There were four Union regiments that were amputees. And the plan, by the way, was to continue that in the regular Army. Now, it's not been done, but you do notice now that there are folks who have been amputees who remain on active duty. One of them is serving in the United States Senate in a state you might recognize it's right across the lake. Tammy Duckworth remained in the guard after she lost both of her legs. You know, she was a helicopter pilot. And if you read her marvelous book, she talks about why she did not want to be separated from the service. Her identification as a pilot, her identification as an officer, as a member of the U.S. Army, was so important that she remained as, as long as she could in a reserve unit, even though she was a double amputee. So this concept is still there. That's one of the reasons why that marvelous unit at Walter Reed with the incredible prosthetic devices, those men and women in many cases, I know I've worked there, they want to return to active duty. They do not want to be separated. And to the credit of both the VA and Department of Defense, they try and make that possible. And I think what I'm trying to convey is where this comes from. And the VRC had a lot to do with this. It's the same basic concept. So we have that, uh, that aspect. And I'm going to close with one example from the Left Arm Corps, who was able to get his way into the VRC. His name was William Augustus McNulty. He was from Penobscot County, Maine. And then he goes to New York after he turns 21. He was orphaned. Becomes a bookkeeper in New York. And he enlists in the 10th New York on April 27, 1861, very early enlisting. He becomes a superb soldier, promoted to first sergeant, and he loses his right arm at Fredericksburg. And he's got a long convalescence. Goes back to Maine, and he wants to join the VRC. He should have been absolutely perfect for the VRC. He was a high-ranking non-com. He lost an arm. He was otherwise healthy. They don't want him. It was still the Invalid Corps at that time. They don't want him. And he's absolutely befuddled by this. So on July 12, 1863, he writes the Provost Marshal in Bangor, Maine. And he says, why don't you want me? I don't understand this. And he sends this on. Very soon after, he gets a letter. And actually, it was not, it was not, actually, come to think of it, it was, it was a year later, almost. He gets a letter from the Provost Marshal Office in Washington, D.C., that the Board of Examiners in New York is directed to examine William Augustus McNulty for the VRC. He is, of course, accepted. He stays in the service. And he becomes the assistant superintendent of the subdistrict of Fauquier County, Virginia, in the Freedmen's Bureau. When he submits his handwriting sample to the Bourne 
to the Bourne um, competition, he writes about what he's doing in the Freedmen's Bureau. And I am doing everything in my power for the amelioration of the condition of the poor yet patient Negro. I am bound, God being my helper, to see that their rights and privileges as free men are not infringed upon by those who would wish to still oppress them. He marries the love of his life, Abby McNulty, a teacher. He is pr promoted to brevet first lieutenant because of his tremendous service during the war as a combatant. He's then, he's then promoted again. He marries a woman who becomes a teacher in one of the Freedmen's schools, which of course was the crown of the Freedmen's Bureau, was the educational aspects, remarkable. Uh, W.E. Du Bois writes beautifully about that. And there's a story about McNulty. One of his teachers has to leave. So after spending an entire day administering an office of the Freedmen's Bureau, he teaches at one of the night schools. And there's a marvelous account of this that they couldn't believe that a white soldier in uniform with only one arm would go to the trouble of teaching us. And you could weep over this. That's how committed he was. He was a dedicated progressive Republican. He stayed the course in the Freedmen's Bureau when his enlistment was up. He was reappointed the next day by Grant, who at that point was president. The depredations which are outlined in the book of what he saw as Reconstruction worsened as the depredations of the Klan worsened and what he was forced to deal with. Because don't forget, you had to deal with state courts and local courts. The Freedmen's Bureau could not supersede the authority of civilian courts. They only had a chance to use federal law when the Third Enforcement Act, also otherwise known as the Ku Klux Klan Act, gave the president the authority to declare to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, which is what Grant did in Carolina when they destroyed the first version of the Klan, but it took a federal law and using federal authority to do that, which the Freedmen's Bureau generally did not have. I do want to point this out. They did what they could. And McNulty was known as a remarkable officer. His tenure ends in 1870. He then becomes a deputy postmaster at Culpeper, and he remains in federal service for the rest of his life. So this remarkable organization, which I believe the Adjutant General of Indiana called the most peculiar organization in the annals of American military history, and, and he was absolutely right, came into existence for practical reasons and became something that nobody would have anticipated. And it gave men who want to continue in service of the Union and their fellow citizens a chance to continue. I will end with this article from the Ocean Grove, New Jersey Times, September 23, 1921. The American Legion Convention met in Asbury Park, and it adopted a resolution. Be it resolved that this convention goes on record as being opposed to any organization which uses the terms of imperial nomenclature in designating its officers tries to establish a government apart from the existing, existing and competent federal and state governments, and preaches tenets in contraindication, contradiction to the expressed and practical principles of the Constitution of the United States. Be it resolved that this body, composed as it is of men of all races, colors, and creeds, deprecates the spirit so utterly un-American which preaches class hatred of any kind. We served America in the war, not as Jew or Gentile, not as Catholic or Protestant, not as Caucasian or Negro, but as Americans. As such, we will continue to serve our country, and though we are not as full of threats as the Ku Klux Klan, we warn all others to serve in the same spirit. That was 1921. The Klan had taken over governments in the North, if you recall, the most notorious being in Tim Timothy Egan's new book, The State of Indiana. 
New Jersey, Oregon, parts of Illinois, and other parts, Wisconsin also. The Klan took over entire governments, state houses, and others. And if you ever want to see a photograph that gives you chills, the March of the Klan that in Washington, D.C. Am I right? It is, it's a stunning picture, a staggering picture. We lived in Indiana. Nobody would talk about it, except one friend of mine whose father fought the Klan in northern Indiana. Now the state of Indiana has a big exhibit in the state museum about when the Klan took over the government of Indiana. So times change, and history needs to be taught over and over. But isn't that pressing? That was 1921. I will stop here. I'd love to take any questions. I thank you for your attention.